Welcome to the Buy Box Experts podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. Hi, I'm James Thompson, one of the hosts of the Buy Box Experts podcast. I'm a partner with Buy Box Experts and the former business head of the Selling on Amazon team at Amazon, as well as the first account manager for the Fulfillment by Amazon program. I'm the co-author of a couple of books on Amazon, including the recent book, Controlling Your Brand in the Age of Amazon. Today's episode is brought to you by BuyBox Experts. BuyBox Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. When you hire BuyBox Experts, you receive the strategy optimization and marketing performance to succeed on Amazon. We also support investors with due diligence services. Go to buyboxexperts.com to learn more. Before I introduce our guests today, I want to send a big shout out to the team at Gatita, a global leader in Amazon FBA auditing and reimbursements. Gatita analyzes your Amazon data, reconciles your FBA inventory, and files claims for reimbursements on your behalf. To learn more, check out gatita.com. Today, I'm joined by two guests. First, we have Scott Letourneau, CEO of Sales Tax System, a firm that helps startup e-commerce sellers and retailers worldwide to get registered for sales tax in the states where they have Nexus. Scott is also the CEO of Nevada Corporate Planners, a company that helps e-commerce sellers launch their U.S. businesses, address issues on U.S. entity formations, sales tax, and U.S. tax compliance, U.S. banking, and complete formations. We're also joined by Matt Lavel, a founding partner of Well Insurance, a full-service e-commerce insurance agency able to shop policies with all of the insurance carriers. His firm specializes in helping Amazon sellers to become compliant with Amazon Terms of Services rules on general and product liability protection. Scott and Matt, welcome to the Buy Box Experts podcast today. Thank you, James. Appreciate you having us. Yeah, great to be here, James. Matt, Matt, I've had the opportunity to chat with you many times over the past five years, and I always finish my calls wondering when Amazon was going to get serious about enforcing the product (laughs) liability requirements that they've had in place for ages. And here we are now. You know, late, late, halfway through, you know, 2021. And finally, at the beginning of September 2021, after 20 plus years of running its marketplace, Amazon is finally going to enforce its product liability requirements. So my question to you is, for years, you've been the lonely guy in the corner trying to tell sellers to get serious about protecting their businesses. What are you thinking today? Well, the the emails went out about two weeks ago today. Um, so we have been we've been slammed from that point, but it's uh, you know it's it's not only a matter of satisfying the Amazon requirements, uh, it's also about protecting the assets of the business. Um, my, my philosophy on the insurance is, is always been is, is don't buy the insurance to to just make Amazon happy and, and be sure you stay on their platform, but that if you're involved in that million dollar lawsuit that that you've got some protection there to, right. to protect your brand, protect your business and, and, and everything involved with it. Um, you know, lots of, lots of sellers have million dollar businesses and um, a lot of them don't have any insurance coverage. I mean, that's just a, a basic business one-on-one that uh, I don't see how they fail to, uh, to put that in place from the start. Over the past couple of years, I've read so many stories about Amazon being sued in various States for defective products being sold by third party sellers. Why do you think Amazon is finally enforcing its own rules? What do you think it's trying to accomplish here, Scott? You know, I think what's happening, there's been a, a couple of cases in California and New York specifically. And it's interesting because originally the, the results were against Amazon, right? You want to go after deep pockets. Yep. And so, of course, Amazon has a good legal team, as you know, <laughs> and, and they would rather have that not necessarily be the case. So originally uh, cases were pointing the finger at Amazon, but in two cases in 2020, uh, they were reversed where they said, um, you know, maybe uh, Amazon is is potentially uh, off the hook. And so, and, and then it went back to pointing the finger at Amazon again. So it's at the end of the day, the writing's on the wall. And when you go after somebody for product liability issues and getting sued, typically it's deep pockets. So I think Amazon, kind of like with the sales tax thing, they like to take you know, a little bit of the focus off themselves and they took care of it. So I think in this case, they, they're really saying, you know what, 
we should make sure our uh, our sellers are protected. They should do the right thing. And let's be honest, they want to protect themselves. So, and a lot of the customers are small sellers. And if I'm a customer of Amazon and I'm buying products, my wife does every single day, uh, you probably realize if you're going to go after somebody for product liability and somebody like Amazon, it, it could be very difficult to win that particular case. But if I go after a seller, they have a product liability mm -hmm. insurance policy. I mean, that's what it's there for. So, you know, in the big picture, uh, let's be honest, they're looking out for themselves. But uh, at the end of the day, I think indirectly, this is probably best for sellers because let's be honest, if you're building a real brand, uh, this is a component, as Matt has mentioned, that is part of any business structure. If you sell a product as product liability insurance, especially these days with all the aggregators and opportunities to sell yes, your business, yes. you want to buy a real business. So I think indirectly, although it, it's caused some panic among sellers, I actually talked to a lady uh, yesterday who's been selling since 2014. She didn't even know there was a requirement for product liability insurance. So she had no idea, 2014. Yeah. So this was a shock to her. So I think at the end of the day, it'll turn out to be a good thing, although sellers probably any, any more expense towards compliance, it's not their first joy in life, I would imagine. So Matt, for the benefit of our audience, tell me more about what these new insurance requirements are what, what Amazon third-party sellers are now expected to do to comply with the rules? You know, the, the, the requirements haven't changed. The, the wording on the certificates has changed just a little bit, uh, but, but the requirements have always been there. The, the seller needs a, 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 at least a $1 million general liability policy, must include products liability, must name Amazon.com um, services LLC as an additional insured, um, need to provide them a certificate of insurance, the, the named insured, the mailing address, uh -huh. uh, all of that information that's, that's on the seller central account needs to match perfectly with that certificate. Uh, we, we've had a lot that have been kicked out because that, that they had a, a PO box as a mailing address, but they signed up with, a, with their street address when they originally signed up years ago. And so all, all that needs to match. But, um, you know, the, the, the big thing is Amazon wants to be that additional insured. They want to to have some recourse under your policy um, in the event that one of your products causes bodily injury or property damage. So there's been this question around uh, domestic sellers and foreign sellers alike, if they're selling on amazon.com, they need this policy. Uh, not, not to go too, too far into this, but if, if I happen to not be based in the United States, but I'm selling on .com, what extra wrinkles are there for me to, to, to have to deal with in order to comply effectively and have this insurance policy? To, to, to do things right, they, they really need an LLC set up in, in the U.S. and they need to run their, their .com business through that LLC. Um, just, it just helps to, to streamline things, to keep things um, the, the, way that, the way that the business should, should probably run it. And Scott can probably uh, attest to that a little better than I can. Yeah, so to add to that is, there's some additional requirements for the non-residents. So they're a little bit more in the panic mode with this September 1st deadline. And it's it's really, per se, if we call it a deadline, it's, it's a date where there's going to be a change to be accurate. So there's a change and, you know, going from 10,000 three months in a row to 10,000 one month in a row, that's a big change for especially new sellers. <clears throat> and I think the factor you have to look at too is, or any seller, especially non-residents, what's the product category you're selling? So we have a lot of clients from Australia. <clears throat> and there are some folks that can provide product liability insurance in other countries, but many times they don't cover certain things. For example, uh, exercise equipment, children's toys, supplements, items that have uh, much higher liability, and therefore the premiums are more for the insurance coverage. Okay. So those particular folks are looking at this deadline and these extra hoops you have to set up, and you want to do it properly. Of course, you don't want to just go on the internet, form an LLC for 150 bucks, and have no idea what you're telling the IRS, and find out you got a tax surprise <laughs> 18 months later, right? But I'm so compliant with Amazon's rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, but it's like one step forward, three steps backward, yeah. right? Yeah. And we see that all the time. So we try to anticipate all the steps to make sure you get the compliance right. And so they have options there, but I have clients that'll calibrate the 
you know, if you can't have any coverage, well, then your only option is to go to Matt and then we come to us and we set it all up properly. Uh, so that's, that's what's been happening in a lot of those situations. And again, the September 1st um, update, we should call it. The big question in life is, when will it really be enforced as, as you brought up earlier? Like, okay, they're changing the rule. There's been some court case changes. And does this mean they're more serious about it? Probably. But when is somebody going to get that lovely notice that they have 30, 60 days to comply? Yes. Yes. So there, there's a, so there's, there's more steps for those folks separate from the U S folks that it's a little bit easier to go directly to map and get taken care of. Scott, you, you talked about factors that might impact the actual cost of the insurance. Are there other types of big issues that sellers need to be thinking about around what kinds of costs they can likely expect in, in a product liability insurance coverage? Well, I think the step that comes in before that, which, which I see as the challenges with like the new sellers, like imagine you're selling supplements and it's, it's a huge niche, right? And now at the first $10,000 in sales, you need product liability insurance. And, and Matt can share in a moment more of those costs, but the costs are much higher. They're not gonna put anybody out of business, but if you're a new seller, just did 10,000 in one month, uh, you're not profitable. Yep. You haven't paid yourself. Yep. Hopefully you have enough food from money from something else to eat every day. So they don't wanna find out they gotta, you know, spend 3,500 bucks on product liability insurance. Uh, so those sellers probably are, have to navigate a little bit more of the, the overall costs of their business and things of that nature. So uh, the factors uh, besides you know, the type of product and the risk that comes involved with the insured, I think Matt can comment on what other factors may come into play that would impact maybe the length of time to get coverage uh, I, I would add that, you know, some folks will, and it, it's a minor thing, but it's a factor that they will, you know, what state should I incorporate? Even if you live in the U.S., Delaware is popular mainly for people going public, which is certainly not Amazon sellers, but it's a knee yeah. jerk, right? Yeah. But, you know, I asked Matt, you know, uh, do those costs, are they different in the state you pick to incorporate? And he said, yeah, you know, Delaware has a tendency to be higher. So, nobody would have anticipated that factor. So that's something that could come into play. I'm sure Matt has some other thoughts that, that are more specific to either the time frame or costs. So Matt, I'm an Amazon seller. What kinds of major factors are going to impact the cost of the insurance policy that I have to get? The, the, the first major factor is, is going to be, are you a reseller or are you a, a brand and a private label? Okay. Uh, are you importing those products from China? If you are importing those products from China, you, you essentially become the manufacturer of those products, even though you don't physically have any hands on dealings with that manufacturing process. Um, you can't subrogate back against a Chinese manufacturer. So you assume all of the product's liability. Um, if, if that product were to fail, if that product were to cause someone to be injured, you know, a battery ignites, burns a house down. Um, you become the manufacturer and you assume all of the product's liability. So you need to be classified correctly. Uh, we've had a lot of a lot of customers here recently that uh, that are they're being classified as resellers when they're actually they're the manufacturer of the products and and uh, and that that greatly you know greatly affects the rates they go from you know five hundred dollars a year on a policy to to five thousand dollars well they they see well someone can write me a, a five hundred dollar policy well, why wouldn't I go with that well because you're not covered correct right, I mean, you're, right you may satisfy Amazon's requirements. But you're not protecting your business whatsoever, and and it's just uh, it's hard to get people to understand that that they're not reselling that product, that that they are the manufacturer, and, and that you know that that affects the rates. Um, so let me ask you this: uh, Let's say I'm an Amazon seller. I've never been compliant with this. Now I need to rush and go get myself liability insurance. What are some of the issues that I should be considering before I purchase the insurance? and make sure that I, I get the right certificate of insurance over to Amazon. You, you need to make sure that, that the agent that you're dealing with, first of all, understands e-commerce. Right. Um, it's, it's a very specialized field. Um, your, your agent down the street that you write your home and your car through probably doesn't understand it. They don't understand how you're sourcing your products. They don't understand how you're listing, how you're marketing them. 
They don't understand what a 3PO warehouse is. Um, there's just a lot of factors that go into to play there. And uh, just just deal with someone that, that understands what, you know, FBA means. Uh, you know, be, be sure that they know that you're manufacturing, that you're importing those products. Um, or if you're if you're reselling, I mean, just just be sure that you have, you have to ask questions and you have to give information. You, you can't be you can't withhold information they expect to be covered properly. Everything needs to be forthright and, and you know, everything needs to be up front and laid on the table. And then where the chips fall, the chips fall from that point. So Matt and Scott, you've both talked a little bit about this concept of you can buy a policy to meet Amazon's requirements, but it may not necessarily cover your business properly. I'm curious about if I go out and I do buy the right kind of policy for the right kind of, you know, representing the right kind of seller that I am, how do I make sure that I actually am protected appropriately? And, and, and here's where my question's coming from. I've bought car insurance. I bought homeowner's insurance. And when I start reading the details, I discover there's all these carve outs for all sorts of crazy stuff that actually is likely to happen. And so how do I, as a seller, anticipate what are the five or 10 most likely ways in which I'm going to need to exercise that insurance policy? And how do I make sure that policy is protecting me appropriately? My recommendation is, is find an agent you can talk to. Pick up the phone and call them. Send them an email. Ask them, um, what, what, am I, what are the exclusions? Look, look at the, read the policy forms. Uh, insurance is a very much a relationship-based business. Um, you, you know, you can go online, you can point and click and hit drop down boxes and hit submit and get a rate yep. Yep. and think you have coverage, but do you really have coverage? Do, do you know what those limits mean, how they work for you? Um, call somebody who does, you know, pick, pick up the phone, call me and, and I'll, I mean, I can get free consultations. I'll, I'll talk to you about limits and how they apply to your yep. business, how they cover your business and what they do and don't do. Uh, that, that's the thing is just, Find somebody that understands it and, and ask questions. It's the big thing. Amazon has given sellers not, not a lot of time to finally get their act together. Right. If I pick up the phone today and I start dialing for insurance, there's still going to be some time required for the brokers to be able to shop those rates and for the carriers to come back and say, okay, here's the coverage that we're willing to provide. G- give me a rule of thumb in terms of, a seller starting today, how long should they expect to wait in order to do the full process and, and get themselves coverage? Is that a two week process, a four week oh, process? No, 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 no. no so, so, so someone calls me today and they take the time to fill our form out on our website. It comes directly to me. We start shopping it immediately. Yep. Um, lo- lots of cases we'll have a quote back within the hour. Um, get, get the paperwork over, the, a detailed email of the description of, of what's covered, what's not covered. Um, I can send the paperwork over to get e-signed. It's, I mean, it's a matter of, of hours, not days. Okay. Very, very quick turnaround time. So the, the deadlines that Amazon's put in place, sellers, if they finally decide they need to do something about it, they can do something about it and do something about it quickly then. Oh, absolutely. Okay. No question. Okay. Scott, I want to talk a little bit more about the link between having a U.S. LLC and being able to get an insurance quote that meets Amazon's requirements. What, what are some of the issues that come into play when an EAN, a U.S., EA, sorry, EAN, EIN number is used uh, f- with the U.S. LLC? So if we talk about U.S. residents, it's a little bit easier because, of course, you're likely you're going to have a Social Security number. So those EIN numbers, if even we have some sellers still hard to believe are operating as sole proprietorships, they now they want to get insurance policy and they're thinking, well, I've do I want it in my name? Maybe this is the time to form their company, right? Yes. So they do that. They form a company with, an, with, the, uh, with the social security number. Of course, we can go online to get the EIN uh, basically immediately after the SS4 form is filled out. So we can do that. We take a screenshot of that. Obviously, there's some areas the IRS does send a, an official letter. About three weeks later, it comes in the mail. Sometimes that doesn't impact this, but it impacts things like banking or other things. So that's fairly straightforward. Uh, you know, usually it's more what, how should my structure be taxed? And there's LLC has four different options. So we walk through those variables. That's a different subject that does impact time frame because as I was talking to Matt about it, asking the same questions you did, what's the biggest thing that slows down the process? And it's the ability of someone to fill out the form correctly. <laughs> to get the process started. So okay. you know, 
rightfully so we're you know panicked in a rush and we want to get it submitted well then you miss something that goes to a different box and then somebody has to review it send it back so those, those are things you want to anticipate that impact and obviously when we get to non-residents uh that's a different ball game because the irs changed their rules a year ago uh we have a lot of foreign sellers that already have a company in place some of them have an ein number because some actually were in compliance with sales tax previously but now Amazon takes it over. They've kind of shut down most of those accounts, but they have an EIN and yeah. for the foreign company. Now, if we set up a, a U.S. entity, the U.S. entity has its own EIN, right? Well, the challenge with COVID, as, as we know, it's impacted uh, especially some government agencies and, and the international division of the IRS that does EINs, they've... Uh, for whatever reason, that they must be like down to six people. I mean, it's something really low because it's taking up to 45 business days mm. to the EIN. Now, and this has been since uh, about June of last year, it's taking that long. Now, the good news is with, with the insurance part, Matt can share a little bit about that, that as long as we have it applied for, he can move forward yes. on his steps. So that dramatically changes the process. So Okay. Again, if you fill out our form correctly, and we have a video and we have samples to try to speed that up for you to keep it simple, even though there's some steps involved. Once they submit it, we form the entity and several states are within about 48 hours and we get the SS4 on its way, faxed to the IRS. Then we can kind of transfer you over to Matt to get the ball, keep the ball rolling. So that's, that, that is a, it, it helps the situation dramatically. Of course, the sellers naturally, um, especially if they're making a transition, they have concerns about other things about how do I update Amazon after? Am I gonna? Is my account gonna be suspended? Is that gonna impact? Well, that, that was that was my next question. Was you know if I had my social security number in there and now I've got to put a different different company number in there, is Amazon gonna potentially put me on hold, thinking that uh, you know there's fraud going on in my account? Yeah, as, as Matt mentioned earlier, you want things to line up right with Amazon. They have some algorithms. There's mm -hmm. some natural things that should match. And I did some training last year with the uh, Amazon seller central reps in the EU about U.S. sales tax. And in exchange, I said, I had a list of these questions. I go, tell me exactly how your internal algorithms work on this because <laughs> I, I want to know this. So basically, you want to really make sure like addresses match up between bank accounts, whether that's Payne or somebody, the business address and sweet, you know, sweet numbers, misspellings, all these things create yes. issues, as we know. So if those things line up, then you're basically retaking the tax interview. And the tax interview uh, is somewhat simple, except when you get to, let's say, a single member LLC owned by a foreign entity, Amazon kind of has a different issue in their tax interview about single member LLCs disregarded. So you wanna get those dots to line up with Amazon. And we also wanna keep the good old IRS in mind. Yep. So yep. if we check all the boxes properly, then we get through, then we're in good shape. If, if we, you miss a couple steps on that end of it, uh, then that's where the sellers get concerned about, of course, my account is uh, either not activated or, or heaven forbid, the biggest fear of a lot of sellers, not as much U.S. is the dreaded utility bill that matches the company name. And they've Amazon has gotten <laughs> smarter, as you know, over periods of time, and they've yeah. tightened up what can be a utility bill. And they're, they're, they want to get to more real companies uh, so that uh, we have a solution for it. But we'd like to avoid that and do it right the first time, if that makes sense. I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want to come back to you, Matt, uh, around the policy itself. I, I'm an Amazon seller. My business is growing significantly year to year. I'm probably going to have to tell you how, what level of sales I have and what level of sales I have now versus what I have at the end of the year might be quite different. When you start looking at different types of issues that I may have, good, good issues that I may have as a seller, how do I tell you, what are the things I need to tell you that I may not realize I need to tell you that are going to ultimately impact the, the policy that I need and making sure that I have the appropriate level of protection? 
Right. Once, once we've had a chance to evaluate the products and, and figure out where the, where the policy needs to be classified, um, the, the next rating factor is, is, like you said, the gross sales. And, and those will be an estimate for the next, the next 12 months. Um, so basically August 2021 to August 2022. Um, and, and, you know, if we estimate, let's say we estimate a million dollars and you actually do 1.5, yep. then, then the company will come back at the end of the policy term next year and they will do a sales audit. Um, they'll want to know, you know, run a quick book report or, or an accounting report, and they'll want to see what your actual sales were for, for those policy dates. And if they're over, then you're going to owe some, some excess premium. Uh, if they're under, then, then there could be a credit back. So it, it, works, it works both ways, unless it's a minimum premium policy uh, for whatever reason. But th- those are easy. And, and I have a lot of sellers that, you know, they say, well, I, th- I think I'm going to do X number this year, but, you know, I really hope that, that you know, we take off and we really grow. And, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll mark my calendar for six months out and just reach out and say, hey, you know, we, we've got we we have X, you know, estimated here. Are you still on track for that, or do we need to to make a policy change? And okay, real real simple change, and it's a uh, you know, it's it's good to keep in contact with with some of those guys that because they, uh, you know, businesses these these e commerce businesses change so rapidly, and uh, the the growth it goes it goes crazy sometimes. So. Um, it's a, but that's, that's, that's something that, that we'll do and we'll provide and we'll, we'll help through that process. When I think about costs that I'm going to be paying uh, to operate my business, you know, I've got the Amazon commissions, I've got advertising, I've got fulfillment costs. Is there some general range rule of thumb that I can use around the types of costs that insurance may play into my overall uh, business, business operating expenses? No, there's, I mean, it, just because there's so many variables, the, the variables of, of the product type, the variables of where you're sourcing those from, uh, the, the gross sales, there's really not a, not an X percentage that you could put and say, this is, you know, you can, you can ballpark this for your expense. Okay. Um, it just, it's just, there, there's so many variables that go in. It's just, it's not, not an easy, easy thing to, to guesstimate on that. Well, let me ask you this. Many years ago, I was a seller in Amazon. And to say that I knew what I was doing when it came to things like insurance, I did not. I, I did have liability insurance. I got this thing called a certificate of insurance. Right. But I don't really understand what it was meant to do. I just know that I had to submit it and have it ready to go. T- tell us a little bit more for, for those who are not as familiar with the, the paperwork and what's needed along the way to keep things happy with Amazon. Uh, how, how, what does Amazon need the CIO for? What's it for? How do they verify it? What's, what's the future going to look like here as far as you know? Well, a, a, a CIO is, is short for certificate of insurance uh, that Amazon does require. And, and what that is, that's basically a snapshot of your, a one page snapshot of your policy. Uh, it shows the, the agent that writes the policy. It shows your, your business name and address. Yep. It shows the, the company that writes the policy. Um, it shows your, your policy number. Your, whether it's an occurrence or claims made form, the policy dates, the liability limits, if there's a deductible. Uh, and then in the bottom of it, that's where, the, and there's also a box there that we, we need to check for the additional insured. Uh, but at the bottom, that's where you, that, that Amazon.com services LLC. Yes. Uh, and, and their specific wording and address will be listed. Uh, it's signed by the agent. And again, it's just a, it's just a, it's a one page snapshot of, of the actual policy that's in force. So I've got the paperwork. I've checked the box with Amazon. Uh, you are also telling me, oh, I've got the right level of service. I've checked the box in terms of doing what's appropriate for my business today. But now that's got me thinking, wait a minute, are there things that I can do to reduce the overall risk of my business? Should I be auditing what I carry in my, my catalog? How should I be thinking through how I could reduce, easy to reduce risk within my business? Give me some perspective on how to think that through. The, the, the one big, big thing that is, is often required but, but can help on the rates is, is the safety testing. Okay. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're importing products from China, uh, be sure you're doing your safety testing and, and send those safety testing reports to your agent. Um, you know, they, they can have some discussions with the underwriter, which, which could result in some, some discounts or some premium savings. Um, if you can prove that, hey, my product is, you know, has been tested. It's, you know, lead free. It's, you know, children approved or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, that's, that, that's something you can definitely, um, definitely send over that, that, that could help the, the premiums. So, so that helps reduce my premiums, but I guess I'm asking a more fundamental question around 
what should I as a seller be doing to look for risk within my business that may ultimately result in me being sued, whether or not I've got the proper coverage necessary to protect against that. At the end of the day, nobody wants to be sued. Right. So, so how do I think about best practices to minimize risk in my business? And I realize this is silly in some ways to be asking you, but, but we're all inherently creating risk by going to market every day. And so the, uh, the question then becomes, how do I go looking for risk so I can decide whether it's acceptable risk? As far as the, 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 the categories that, that are generally harder to insure, um, you know, those would be, you know, baby, infant, children, toys, all the way up to, you know, in, any of those products that involve, you know, children or, or young adults, um, you, in, anywhere from, from, from toys to fingernail clippers, um, medical devices, uh-huh. supplements, health and nutrition, sporting goods, sporting equipment. Um, all of those are generally harder to insure than your typical just, just household products. Uh, groceries are, are relatively easy, um, you know, just uh, but but those those other risks that none of the standard carriers want. And that's where we have to reach out to the, the brokers uh, and, and shop it on that on that side of things. And, and then the rates go along with the exposure. We've talked about Amazon. We've talked about Amazon sellers. I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about Amazon customers. Do you think Amazon customers will be pleased or even pay attention to the fact that third-party sellers now actually have proper liability insurance? Are things going to change in the way that consumers even see the offering from these third-party sellers? In my opinion, no. I don't know. I don't know that a lot of people understand that Amazon is a bunch of individual sellers to begin with. Um, I bet if you did a poll to the general public, they think Amazon is selling most of these products. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think requiring the seller to have a product liability insurance policy changes the thought process of, of the general public, in my opinion. Scott, Scott you have a- yeah, I, I would agree with that because as a customer, you got to step into your, you're buying a product or service. You know, I, I'm not necessarily when I buy this power tool, you know, what's the product liability and, you know, limits on this company in case my, you know, 14 year old daughter uses it and something goes awry. Yeah. What kind of a check am I going to get? I, I, you know, I, I, I anticipate things in life, but not that far. So I don't think that's going to come into play unless it came to, I could say perhaps, you know, would it be possible to exercise equipment where it's something significant? Is it safe? Is it this? Um, you know, but again, what I look to, I look to the reviews before I look to, you know, and if they had a $5 million policy coverage, I might be, why do they have a 5 million? I mean, maybe that's a concern. I, you know, you'd have to say, <laughs> right. Yeah. You would kind of like, maybe there is some real concerns here. I mean, is there a certain percentage of the U S population that are ambulance chasers and, you know, they're going to, you know, try to buy a product and see it's a free payday, but that's such a small percentage, but I don't see it making much of a difference in the big picture as far as sales and results of sales. Obviously, if you get suspended and you can't sell, that's going to be a problem, but in the big picture, I don't see it making a big impact. So let me ask you, Matt, what what have Amazon customers had to do in the past to seek damages if a third-party seller's product ended up being defective? We've talked about the fact that there's been these court cases, but tell me, what, what are Amazon customers actually doing? Are they actually collecting on dollars because their finger got broken or you know, they ended up with a rash or something horrible happened as a result of consuming a third-party seller's product? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not 100% certain as far as what the, the process has been, uh, but I assume if, if someone has, has been injured by a product or, or a property damage by one that, that they've, they've, they've hired an attorney and, and that attorney has brought anyone and everyone into that lawsuit that they possibly could. Um, whether that's the seller, the vendor, uh, Amazon, uh, in, anybody in between that, that they could track down and associate with that product. Uh-huh. Um, and, and if you don't have an insurance policy, um, you're on your own to defend yourself and then pay any judgments that you could be found negligent of. 
what's likely on the horizon of emerging insurance requirements for sellers on Amazon? What, what, what do you think Amazon is going to do next? Let's assume they do enforce. What's next? I, I think you see a lot of people that, that are scrambling to, to get a policy in place because the, the bottom line is there's a lot of sellers out there that, that didn't think they need it, didn't, they weren't going to buy it until Amazon basically said you had to. Right. Um, so I, I think there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of scramble in the marketplace here in, in, the, in the near future. I want to close out our discussion today by asking each of you to talk a little bit about what your companies do. We, we've talked about obviously the impact of, of having to have product liability insurance in place, but you're both, you're both dealing with third party sellers in slightly different ways. Scott, t- take us through your companies and, and how you work with Amazon sellers today. So, so there's two parts. First is the, the foundation of your Amazon business, which is making sure when we form a company, an LLC or corporation, it's a complete foundation. Most mm-hmm. LLCs formed online actually have zero protection based upon court cases, piercing the entity veil. They just form the articles, the I, and that's it. We, we don't... Uh, uh, sell you a car without brakes. Let's put it that way. So yes, yes. we want to make sure we start with something's complete. We just don't get you in the door. So we also want to anticipate the next two or three moves ahead. So when you're going to Amazon, updating the accounts, making that transition, we can help in that area. Uh, we also, obviously with the, the non-resident market, we've worked with different tax attorneys and tax treaties, and we have CPAs that work behind the scenes because we know it, it's like a, four by four relay race, you got to pass the baton and, and, you know, to the next professional. And, and we make sure that the tax people we're working with, we do things properly on our end. So we don't create a problem on the back end. So we do the formations. We can do those in all 50 States. We've been doing it for 24 years. Uh, we know all the ins and outs of, of the things that can cause issues. And on the sales tax side, we have a lot of Amazon sellers that might, want to diversify and they might uh, open up a Shopify store, for example. Mm -hmm. And of course, sales tax has flip-flopped over the last couple of years. It used to be Amazon sellers had an issue with FBA physical nexus. Now they're a marketplace. But now because of economic nexus, it's it's potentially like selling in 45 different countries with thresholds. And there's 26 states that have thresholds of 200 transactions or less. And, you know, a lot of people are behind. So adding Shopify makes sense for your own, your website, but it adds a layer of complexity. So we can help simplify that. Good news. Everybody's probably a little bit behind on sales tax. It's just a matter of kind of when you get in compliance. The main peer Amazon sellers are pretty much in good shape. Although there's states like Florida, for example, that they have complete amnesty that expires uh, next month. And if you've been selling for four or five years and you never registered in Florida, uh, it, it's a chance to very inexpensively wipe the slate clean for Florida. And so those are some things that we can help with. So pass the baton from you form the company to now I need product liability insurance. Matt, take us through well insurance and what you do. What was the full scope of what you do for e-commerce sellers? Well insurance is an independent insurance agency. Uh, we're able to shop that particular account to find the, the best, the best coverage and the best rate. Uh, we, we specialize in, in e-commerce. Uh, we, we've been in the e-commerce space for five years now. Um, we can do the general products liability. We can do the inventory in the 3PL. Um, if you have an employee working in, in your personal warehouse, we can do the workman's comp. We can do the business auto. Uh-huh. Uh, we also write a lot of ocean marine cargo. Um, we can cover those shipments coming from China while they're in port, um, while they're being domestically transported, and, and also in the warehouse. So uh, we, we run a basically a full service independent insurance agency um, that, that specializes in caters to e-commerce sellers. We, Great. we can also help Amazon sellers become compliant with the new, Com- record, the new rules. <laughs> compliant. <laughs> that is the key word today, children. Compliant. <laughs> Scott and Matt, I want to thank you both for joining us today. For listeners interested in learning more about Matt's firm, Well Insurance, please check out well-insurance.com. And to learn more about Scott's firm, Launch with Confidence, check out www.launchwithconfidence.com. Thanks for joining us today and join us again next time on the Buy Box Experts podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Katita. Katita is a global leader in Amazon FBA auditing and reimbursements. 
Katita analyzes your Amazon data, reconciles your FBA inventory, and files claims for reimbursements on your behalf. No obligations, no hidden fees, just Katita recovering your money. Katita helps you get your money back into your pockets so you can focus on investing in more inventory and growing your business. To learn more, check out Katita.com. That's G-E-T-I-D-A dot com. Thanks for listening to the Buy Box Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.